Let me introduce you to Janet Panak. She has a master's in communication. She's a doctoral student, and she's also a clinical instructor for a medical student, uh, for medical school, IU School of Medicine, mm -hmm. Indiana University. Thank you. And we just spoke together at the NCA mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, and their title is actually Communications Civic Callings, and our panel discussion was Turning the Tables on Patient Advocacy, Responsible Patients Informing Responsive Providers. Mm -hmm. Tell me, when did patient advocacy get personal for you? Oh, that's a really good question. That happened um, soon after my daughter was diagnosed with bone cancer at the age of 12. So that was 2007, almost 10 years ago. Um, prior to that, I really had no experience in the medical arena at all. So it was really as a patient advocate for my adolescent daughter at the time. And looking back, what worked and what didn't work that makes you so passionate about patient advocacy now? Right. Well, there were many medical errors as a result of ineffective communication, not only between um, patient and provider, because my daughter didn't know how to communicate with physicians, but also between specialists. So um, looking back on it now, I can see you know the work that needs to be done. At the time, I was just confused and we didn't know what to do. So, um, so yeah, I can see the need for both patients and providers and that's what I try to do now, to work on both sides and to advocate for both um, medical students who are becoming physicians and for patients who are becoming adult patients too. So dig a little bit deeper. Your daughter spent basically three years in bed during high school well, no, she was in treatment for chemotherapy for a year, so she was inpatient. Um, but she suffered side effects from the chemotherapy, not from the cancer itself, that affected her, um, her mobility and her ability to function. Um, but because her symptoms were not taken seriously and we had to see so many specialists, um, she ended up suffering from heart block that caused a lot of dizziness and um, inability to attend school regularly for three years. So that's where the three-year mark came from. So she wasn't in bed, but she was debilitated to the point where she was not fully functioning. As a high school student. As a high school student. So yes, her last three years of high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, that was as a result of the treatment. And, not the and, and how did it eventually come to be that her heart block was properly diagnosed and treated? Mm -hmm. um, well, eventually I just took her to a different institution because we weren't getting the answers that we needed from the center where she was being treated. So I had to take her somewhere else. Uh, because they were relying on the um, on the notes that you know were taking place during the period of time since she was diagnosed there. It wasn't until I moved her over that they started new interviews and and talking to her that they. And according to the doctors at that time, what was her narrative? What was her story? Well, it varied, um, but if, eventually, because she had so many complaints of dizziness without physical cause, uh, they labeled her as having a somatoform disorder. And she was pretty much dismissed as it was being in her, it was in her head, and mother was facilitating her symptoms and so on. So she wasn't getting the treatment that she needed because she was dismissed as having uh, mental issues as the cause for her for her dizziness. So uh, we've talked about this before, and you and you told me about how you know the records really lacked the details that she was providing. They did, yes. But they also added other details in, mm -hmm. such as. Uh, when you had a nose ring, as yep. you have right now. Yeah, I didn't so. didn't realize that until you know, yeah, until so I had requested the record, and they they noted that mother had gotten her nose pierced, and um, mother asked many many questions. Um, so there were there was a lot of extra information in there that um, you can see upon reflection how that would um, potentially adversely affect a patient's treatment, um, and it did. I mean, it definitely did. When you watched episode one inaccurate health records and learned about the story of Dr. Hallway, the one who would just wave from the hall and write stuff up about the patient. Mm -hmm. That was that was personal for you and your family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our, our record did not accurately reflect what happened uh, between physicians with my daughter. So, you know, sort of moving forward, that's something we always want to be aware of and, and to, to keep track of the medical record because um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen down the road, who else is going to view that and might view that inaccurate information that would later, you know, come back to affect us, you know, at a later time. 
as it did with your daughter. As it did with my daughter, yeah. How did she? How did she finally overcome the the the, the stigma that she was under? Mm -hmm. How did how did she, from a communication point of view, perhaps psychological? Mm -hmm. You know, because I mean, in fact, she was told she was making everything up until. Yeah. Yeah. She finally was diagnosed with the heart problem and got a pacemaker. Right. Right. And, yeah. and that and that changed her life. It did. It did. Unfortunately, we had to move institutions completely where they didn't have access to her medical her record from the previous institution. So, they so started fresh. Starting fresh and running new tests revealed the heart block and ultimate treatment of pacemaker, which solved everything. Had she had the pacemaker three years prior, she would not have missed all the school, it would not have affected her uh, life as much, as dramatically as it did. So yeah, we had to go back and start all over again. Had I known that we could have looked at her health record at that time, we might have been able to challenge some of the things that were taking place, but, but we didn't know. How is her relationship now with her medical providers? It's good now because she has a team that, um, that found you know, the physical cause for her they're, symptoms. They're in so line with what they're, the they're aligned are. with it now, yeah. Mm -hmm. But she still has, um, you know, long term health care issues that all pediatric patients who survive cancer will have mobility issues and things of that nature. So uh, it's important to her that she keep track of that and continue to advocate for herself with all of the things that we've been talking about and learning about um, with respect to the electronic health record and in communicating with providers. I'm glad she's doing so much better now. Me too. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thanks. What's your advice for patient advocates moving forward? Like, what, what do you tell your daughter to do moving forward? Mm -hmm. um, well, I tell her to give as much information surrounding her symptoms now that she can. So not just about dizziness, but when and where it occurs and under what circumstances, times of day, um, things like that. Um, I encourage her to ask a lot of questions something she didn't do as an adolescent and didn't know to do. So um, she takes a notebook and she has questions prepared ahead of time and continues to ask questions. She also you know, repeats back information to make sure that she has it correct. And she expresses concerns about how potential treatments might you know, affect her, you know, her daily life or um, long-term outcomes. But also she asks you know, what happens if she does nothing. So she is better equipped now um, to manage her care. She's now 21, almost 22. So. I still advocate for her. <laughs> as you always will. I always will, yeah. As you always yeah. will. Part of our presentation title at NCA mm -hmm. just a few days ago was uh, addressing responsible patients. So when somebody says, what is a patient advocate or how can a patient advocate for themselves? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a level of responsibility and uh, I believe, you believe, that this is a responsibility that people are willing to take on. Mm -hmm. What do you say to the naysayers that say that patients don't care, uh, they're, they're not interested in reading their records, they're not interested in contributing information, mm -hmm. they, they want to stay in the passive role mm -hmm. and uh, you know, let all decisions be made for them by someone else rather than participating. What do you say to those naysayers? Well, first of all, there is, the one element of truth in that is that part of shared decision making is asking the patient how they want to communicate. And there is a small you know, percentage of people who will choose not to make a decision, but that's still a choice. Um, by and large, what we're hearing from young people and people of all ages is they didn't know that the expectation was there for them to participate in shared decision making. Once they know, uh, it's kind of something they always felt that they wanted to do. Critical thinking skills are just paramount to being active in anything that we do. It crosses over. It's not just in healthcare, it's in everything that we do. We don't buy a car without researching it ahead of time. We don't buy houses without looking at schools and neighborhoods. I mean, this is not, it's not unusual for us to look at healthcare in the same way. And so, um, so yeah, I think it's very important that, that patients start to be addressed as active, actively engaging with their healthcare professionals just as they would in any other avenue in their lives. And what do you think that's going to do to healthcare quality, cost, and satisfaction? Mm -hmm. Well, studies show that if patients are more active in their healthcare and asking questions that they're more satisfied. Um, it's true that we have to have physicians who are equally engaged and so, you know, by talking to them, you know, we can teach them what the expectations are. 
Um, so I think it's going to be a big turnaround for everybody. In the fight for patient advocacy, you know, part of the problem right now is that is that so many patients, family members, parents are, are siloed. They're all having the same struggle, the same problem, telling their stories. Mm -hmm. And you know, all we need is just one little catalyst on a national level to say, mm -hmm. hey, there's federal laws out there that allow you to read and correct and amend the record, mm -hmm. and there's rules and regulations. Uh, there's research that's been done that, that shows how this whole flow can go, mm -hmm. and preliminary-wise, there's, there's evidence that this will reduce cost. Mm -hmm. It'll improve quality, because if the person keeps saying, I'm having this problem, or this needs to be adjust, mm -hmm. uh, addressed, obviously the, the, the quality is going to improve, because you're addressing the issues at hand. Uh, but, but one of the nicest is satisfaction. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that people can be pleased that, uh, that they're able to represent themselves mm -hmm. and they're, they're, they're then able to see it documented in the record so it can be shared among all the providers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's funny how you know, transparency has been such a buzzword, but, but now with healthcare, it looks like it's finally going to um, reveal itself mm -hmm. you know, as being not just a buzzword, but, a, but, but an action mm -hmm. where, where Patients are, are, are taking on this new level. It's a movement. It's, it's a, a movement. movement. It's a movement. Yeah. And it's it's I think I think it has the opportunity to be a peaceful movement. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be one where, where, where people are fighting with their doctors. Mm -hmm. Around the other the other way around, they're actually working with their doctors to make sure that the concerns are listed and documented in the record, making mm -hmm. sure that everything in the record is accurate mm -hmm. and to prepare it all for big data so that our information technology graduates can come in there and tear apart all that data mm -hmm. and find problems like with your daughter. I mean, if your daughter's problems were to have been, you know, we, we've gone over the 30-some questions <laughs> that the doctor's supposed to ask, mm -hmm. you know, and you go down it. If those 30 questions would have been, you know, asked of your daughter, mm -hmm. answered, and reviewed, it probably would have showed all of her problems. Yeah. You know, I mean, it would have been probably pretty obvious that yeah, she it needed a been. pacemaker. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. probably what the people said when they finally saw him for the pacemaker. It is. Like, oh, this it is what's going on. Yeah, she needed a pacemaker. Yeah, she had her blood. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. And you, you make a good point. I mean, patient advocacy as a movement is a win-win for everybody. Who would possibly lose on it? Dr. Hallway. Well, Dr. Holloway, <laughs> Dr. Holloway would do. You can't walk yeah. down the hall going, uh -huh. hi, 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 and, yeah. and charge up. Yeah. But, you know, we really don't want doctors behaving like Dr. Holloway anyway. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want that for any of our relatives or friends, right. and that would be horrible. Right. And imagine if the person's having something really happening to them, and somebody's waving from the hall saying it's all okay. Mm -hmm. That kind of defeats all medical education, yeah. Yeah. you know, all training. Yeah. I mean, it just, it just throws all that. But, you know, that's also... That, that's also just a small segment, mm -hmm. but but you didn't necessarily see Dr. Hallways. You saw a bunch of physicians. What do you think happened with the with the breakdown in communication? Mm -hmm. Because you had levels of Dr. Hallway mm -hmm. happen in your family. Well, I, you know, in talking to them upon reflection, and I did talk to them, uh, they were just reading small amounts of information in a record. They just you know scanned it and assumed that the person that she had seen prior to them had addressed some of these issues and they had not. So they would just go with the last little piece of information that they were given without ever really talking to her about, you know, well, what do you think is going on here? You know, tell us, you know, your, your story. Uh, they just kind of went with these little snippets, so. Somewhere in your PhD work, they don't sit you down and have you tell a secret to 10 people and pass it around the room. That's mm -hmm. probably something more for kindergarten. Mm -hmm. But it seems like healthcare mm -hmm. almost has to remediate to a very low level of understanding that you know, communication cannot be assumed. Well, yeah, and we do exercises like that with our first year medical students where, you know, after they work with a simulated patient, you know, verbally tell us, you know, what you would put in the EHR. And each one of the students tells a different story. You know, if they only have a minute to tell what that story is, it's gonna it's very different from what the from what the next student might tell. So that's very much like the telephone game. You know, if you only have this little window of opportunity to prevent a full narrative it's not going to be complete. Which is why our ultimate push has been for the patient to co-author the story or co-author the narrative and contribute it to the doctor. Yeah. You know, and then that's the sub patient's subjective story. It that's is. the whole idea. It is, yeah. Uh, and, and some people could argue, well, what if they're wrong or what if they lie? But 
I, it's I, still their story. It's still their story, mm -hmm. and I do not sense that uh, your daughter nor anyone in my family seeking health care uh, lied about the symptoms they mm -hmm. were going through. They were just trying to present what was going on. And sometimes it does sound crazy, mm -hmm. you know, and you can, you can see how somebody can jump to the conclusion that people are making stuff up, but mm -hmm. um, that, should, that should be a diagnosis of, mm -hmm. uh, of exclusion after all other reasons are exhausted, mm -hmm. not, you know, a convenient one that comes in because the mom's wearing a nose ear ring. Yeah. <laughs> oh, here's to better health care. <laughs> well, I mean, we're, 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 not, we're not trying to make the doctor or the medical provider a bad person. Mm -hmm. I don't know. think that's coming across either, I think. But yeah. You know, it's funny because I had someone say that episode one made doctors look bad mm -hmm. to the point that... Uh, you know, it shouldn't even be on YouTube because it makes doctors look bad. Interesting. Yeah. Made Dr. Hallway look bad. Made Dr. Hallway look bad. But is there, is there, is there any circumstance where Dr. Hallway should look good? Mm -hmm. I mean, she's fast at seeing patients. Mm -hmm. She can see them fast. Efficiency. Her documentation is the best in the hospital. <laughs> it's not. Generates a lot of bills. It's not documentation. It's not real documentation. No, I can't, I can't think of any scenario where what Dr. Hallway does. Right. So, so, I, so I guess episode one does make doctors look bad in some ways. Well, but you know, there's doctors, everyone. Everyone has a job out there, yeah. and if you're not doing your job, then you're gonna get called out on it. Right? You're gonna get called out. On it. Yeah, <laughs> it's gonna get called out on. Yeah. Yeah, the case presentation um, was was difficult. The one that was published in the uh, medical journal. Mm -hmm. That's difficult because you know, imagine the patient up on the stage telling the story mm -hmm. and then having the records put up behind her that will show mm -hmm. uh, little snippets yes. of her story. What a great teaching tool though for um, clinicians and for medical students. I mean I definitely want to share that with my medical students and I will. Those kinds of stories are very moving to them and everybody has illness in their family somewhere, right? It might be a you know parent or a grandparent or a sibling or themselves so you know in sickness or health, we're, we're all patients of our yeah, healthcare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Medical students really system. identify with these stories, so we want to keep these illness stories running throughout the curriculum. You know, studies show that uh, med students lose their sense of empathy uh, to their patients in their third year. Uh, so we, we don't want that to happen. We want to keep those stories. What do you think that is? Well, you know, I, I think it's because we. We train it out of them, you know, we, we teach them to be Dr. Hallways and you've got, you know, X number of minutes to interact with people and, and they stop seeing people as people and more as a number. Yeah, there's reports of high percentage of uh, Dr. Burnout. Mm -hmm. There's now studies about burnout among residents, interns, residents, and even medical students. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, a, it's such a shame that the further they get involved in 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 the actual practice of medicine, mm -hmm. you know, probably the more it hurts a little bit because of the way the system's set up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, with uh, putting the onus more on the patient and educating the patient equally um, with education, uh, I, I think that the shared decision making is really going to be more useful for both uh, clinicians and for patients as well. So when they truly learn what shared decision making is about and making choices, the patient will be far more satisfied even if it's not eventually as effective as they would have hoped because they had ownership in making that decision and that takes a lot of the, the stress off of the physician as well. Um, and then they come back together and you know, look for other solutions. So a medical encounter has three key components, the history, the examination and medical decision making. The history is the patient's story, but also includes uh, medication list, allergy list, the examination is the physical examination, and the medical decision making is the assessment and plan. It's the diagnoses and it's the treatment plan, whether you're going to take a medication or order a test or do a certain task or exercise. Tell me about how medical decision making changes and transforms to shared decision making okay. between a patient 
and a provider. Right. Well, shared decision making takes place when more than one treatment is an option. So in my daughter's case with bone cancer, for example, chemotherapy was the only option for her. But in some cases, chemotherapy might be an option or radiation, and either treatment plan could adversely affect their quality of life. This is where shared decision making comes into play and where we begin to educate patients on making decisions, to weigh their values, to think about how those outcomes could affect their lives. So it's not a situation where patients are expected to do chemotherapy or not do chemotherapy, but rather think about different treatment options if the outcomes are potentially the same. And that happens more often than, than patients might expect. Yeah, there's always some kind of negotiation of what should we do next? Mm -hmm. Is this what we really think is going on? And what should we expect mm -hmm. as far as a response? Yeah, exactly. And in some cases, the outcome could be the same even if they don't choose any treatment plan at all. Um, so I know with certain ear infections, for example, you can choose to take an antibiotic or not take the antibiotic. If you don't take the anti antibiotic, the treatment, the, the outcome will be the same. It'll go eventually go away. It's not the type of infection that would that would require it. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. But that's the whole idea of the continuous communication between the patient and the it provider is. that can be there. That you know, if we're going to do this treatment approach, whether it's medication or no medication, you know, we should have these expectations of getting better. Mm -hmm. And if that varies, then mm -hmm. you know the decision making process can re engage. Yes. What opportunities do you see uh, unfolding for patients and providers to communicate together that perhaps would be different than what you experienced in your family and what you're trying so hard to, to remedy? Mm -hmm. Well, now that I'm more involved in medical education, because I am adjunct faculty now at the IU School of Medicine, I teach first-year medical students, so I'm seeing at the ground level how um, you know, incoming physicians are being taught to build a relationship with patients, something I wasn't really aware of. So this is new curriculum, by the way, for IU School of Medicine. Um, so they're, they're being taught, you know, how to um, elicit the values of a patient, talk to them more. So that seems very new to me as far as medical training. Um, but also we're reaching out to patients now. Uh, before their patients, making it part of health curriculum uh, for high school students, for example. So teaching young people how to interact with physicians in a way that's never been done before. You know, we used to view the paradigm of the doctor-patient relationship as the pa patient being very passive and the doctor being the expert and you don't ask questions and you don't, you know, you don't advocate for yourself necessarily. And I see big changes as that paradigm shifts to more partnership, more collaborative care, um, as even as patients are encouraged to view their medical record as it's being entered. And we train the uh, medical students in school to sort of do this triangle where, you know, the computer might be placed at the center of the triangle and they work together to um, enter the information into the HR. So I see big changes there. And what's wrong with that? Well, um, it's still not necessarily the patient's story, you know, as in first person. So um, I would like to see more of the patient's, you know, backstory come into play prior to uh, the time that they sit down together. Medical schools are teaching medical students how to communicate. That's been going on for a long period of time, but, you know, the, the focus is, is perhaps changing a little bit now that patients have, you know, the ability to access and amend the record mm -hmm. as a federal right. If you had a, a, a wish list of how this would all work, and where, where the patients are able to participate, contribute information, work together with the providers, relieve the providers of some of the mundane clerical duties, mm -hmm. so they all work together in a partnership of health, how long do you think that will happen before the average person in the United States of America will enjoy that experience with their medical provider. How long do you think it will? Do you think it's going to be 20 years? Do you think it's going to be 10 no. years? Do you think it's going to happen quickly? Yeah, I think it, I think they're ready now. I mean, with the advent of the internet and people are advocating for themselves anyway, right? What's the first thing you do when, when you have a symptoms? People go to Google. They Google their symptoms. They're ready to do their research and they're ready to be involved now. So I think that, that the time is opportune now for both patients and providers to be working together. Okay, there you have it. Time is now.